Welcome. Good morning or uh, good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar is a third in our EPA Water Sense and Alliance for Water Efficiency series focused on outdoor water efficiency topics. If you're looking for previous webinars, the first of our two of our series, you can find them on the Alliance for Water Efficiency's YouTube channel. You need to cover a few housekeeping items before we get started. First, all attendees were muted when they entered the webinar to minimize background noise. To ask questions, please type them in the chat box at the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And Kelly, Joanna, Stephanie, and I will answer these questions at the end of the webinar. Note that we are recording today's webinar too, and this recording will also be posted to the AWE YouTube channel and the WaterSense Partner website. Now for one of our first quick polls, we'd like to learn a little bit about you. First, who do we have on the call today? And we'll just let you respond and then we'll share the results in just a minute. All right, looks like the local state government, water utilities, a few uh, university and uh, other. Thank you. I'm glad everybody could make it today. Our next poll is if you are an irrigation professional, have you earned a water sense label certification? And again, we'll uh, give you a minute to fill it out and we'll talk about the results. All right, looks like uh, a little over 50% is no and there's a lot of you with a yes and thank you very much for those with the yes and hopefully those with the no will uh, earn it soon. And now our third and final poll, how did you learn about this webinar? All right, great. It looks like a lot of it was from the Alliance for Water Efficiency or one of our uh, other emails from WaterSense. Okay, great. Now let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce today's speaker. We have Kelly Cope, professor from Utah State University, and we will have Joanna Enderwada, professor, Utah State University, and Stephanie Dewar, water conservation program manager in the Salt Lake City Department of Public Utilities. And uh, thank you all for joining us, and let's go ahead and transition over to Kelly. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with everyone today. I'd like to start with an overview of what we will be discussing. Uh, there are three presenters, so we will try to keep it as organized as possible. What we'd like to focus on are some of the lessons that we've learned from applied research that we've been conducting here at Utah State University's Center for Water Efficient Landscaping in collaboration with Salt Lake City's Department of Public Utilities and other water agencies, the emphasis today being on Salt Lake City. Um, we are going to try to make very clear the interdisciplinary nature of the work. We are plant scientists by training as well as sociologists. Um, we are very familiar with irrigation technologies and techniques. And the emphasis today will largely be on the human behavior that occurs in the context of climatological and ecological issues when it comes to landscape water conservation. And as an overall goal or theme for our work, we are always trying to build shared knowledge that we gain through our collaborative efforts through the land-grant university here, which is Utah State, and utilities working together. So those are our basic goals for the webinar, and we will get started. Next slide, please. So I'll begin by introducing the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping. 
This is a center based at Utah State that was created in 1999 to conduct research on effective irrigation techniques and other aspects of low water landscaping, including water demand analyses, landscape practices, plant water needs. Uh, I would add irrigation technologies to that as well. The other large part of our mission is disseminating that information to water purveyors, like Salt Lake City Department of Public Utilities. We also work extensively with the Utah green and blue industries, as well as with our Utah State University County Extension offices and the public to support education and informational needs in water efficient landscaping. The individuals that you see there, I just want to note briefly, uh, myself there on the left, my colleague Dr. Larry Rupp, my colleague Dr. Joanna Enterwada, my colleague Dr. Roger Kelgren, and my colleague Dr. Paul Johnson. And I mention them because it is a truly collaborative effort, and so I want to recognize their contributions as well. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping uh, has really two main missions. We perform horticultural research, and we address precision irrigation, we address plant water use requirements, and various other aspects of low water use landscape. But we also have a very strong implementation focus, or we might also call it an extension focus, that addresses social and policy science methods for conserving water in urban landscapes. Next slide, please. So in our work over the years, we have noted several paths towards landscape water use efficiency. And I want to make it fairly clear the approach we're discussing and emphasizing here today. On the one hand, we really emphasize efficiency with existing landscapes. And this is based on what we've observed over the years with the landscapes we see here in the state of Utah. And so when I say legacy there, what I mean is landscapes that people have been working with for some time, uh, landscapes that they would like to do better with in terms of water use, but not necessarily transitioning to native or low water use landscapes. And so that is another path, of course, towards landscape water use efficiency, that transition to different plant materials. Um, but today we're really going to be focusing more on dealing with existing or legacy type landscapes. And the paths, of course, both are going to be based on a standard of ecologically appropriate water use regardless of the landscape. So it may be an existing legacy landscape, it may be a newer native or low water use landscape, but the real focus is providing an ecologically appropriate amount of water to that landscape. And that's going to be based on local climate conditions. You see ET there, which stands for evapotranspiration. So that is a condition that we use to address plant water use requirements. Next slide, please. So the reason that the center was founded in the late 90s, and the reason that the colleagues I mentioned before had been working on landscape water use questions even prior to that, is that here in our state, and I would extend that to our region as well, the over-irrigation of urban landscapes is extremely common. And on the municipal level, what that equates to is anywhere from 65 to 70 percent of overall per capita water use going to irrigate outdoor landscapes. And so for us, that is clearly a great opportunity for conservation efforts. Now through some of the programs that we'll mention here today, we know that typical homeowners or residents in our area irrigate about twice as much as is necessary. And so that leads me back to our emphasis, at least in part, on existing or legacy landscapes. We know that if we can get typical residents to irrigate appropriately, they will be reducing their irrigation by as much as half. So that is a goal of several of our programs. Interestingly, too, we've noticed and found that commercial properties can be irrigated even more than that, so three or four times as much as is necessary. Those landscapes vary in size 
uh, but again, a huge opportunity for conservation of landscape irrigation water. And so what we end up knowing is that nearly one-third of our urban water supply is being wasted by the over-irrigation of landscapes. Again, this is, these are facts that drive the work that we do and the information that we disseminate. Next slide, please. Some other contributing factors as we start drilling down a little bit into the reasons for overuse of water in the landscape. Uh, we know that irrigation systems we come across in our state and region are often poorly designed. Uh, they lack routine maintenance and they also lack uh, effective or efficient operation. And so what that does is result in irrigation that may run off, as you see in the image on the lower left. If it does not run off, it often moves through the soil profile past the depths of any plant roots. And so while it may be performing some function in terms of groundwater recharge, it is not performing its function in terms of plant water use. And so we would consider that a loss to the landscape system. And then, of course, irrigation is occurring more frequently than is required by the landscapes that we see and based on local weather conditions. And so that gets back to that irrigation happening twice as much as it needs to be for typical residents and even more so in the commercial, institutional, and industrial sector. Next slide, please. So one of the programs that I wanted to talk about today in the context of the webinar is what a program we've had here in the state of Utah since 1999. This is called the Water Check Program. And it is a program in which we provide individualized assistance to homeowners, residents, commercial, institutional, and industrial landscape managers to help them evaluate their irrigation efficiency. So it's an entirely voluntary program. The cost to participants is zero, and that is because we have terrific program partners in agencies like Salt Lake City Department of Public Utilities, as well as others. And in the program, we have very well-trained interns visiting the properties, and they're evaluating the outdoor irrigation systems on those properties, running through the system in operation, identifying problems with the irrigation system, and then leaving the homeowner, resident, or landscape manager with an appropriate irrigation schedule, additional information that they may, may require in terms of their plant management, and also recommendations for fixes to their irrigation system that are necessary based on what we observe on the ground. At this point, through the life of the program, we have performed more than 13,000 residential audits and more than 500 commercial, institutional, and industrial audits. And so we have what we feel is a very good picture of landscape water use in the state. Next slide, please. So just a bit more detail on how a water check works once we enter a property. We will meet with residents and managers and explain exactly what our team, so we address the uh, resident in teams of two. We will explain exactly what we're going to do on the property. We request access to the irrigation controller and make note of what their existing irrigation schedule is. And then we manually turn on each irrigation, each irrigation station, walking through each zone to identify the irrigation problems. And so this can be anything from a sunken irrigation, a sunken sprinkler head, a tilted head, a clogged head. We have identified leaks at, through this process. Whatever the case may be, we make note of the problems that we see, what zone they are in, and then some of the supplemental material we provide to the resident or manager helps them address those problems. In order to do a distribution uniformity test, we pick a representative zone for each head type that is in place and conduct a catch cup test. That's where we get distribution uniformity information, application rate of the sprinklers, water pressure. We also do tests for soil texture and rooting depth of the plant material in the landscape, which ends up helping with our overall irrigation schedule. 
Finally, we deliver a customized irrigation schedule for each station on the clock. We present that with explanation to the resident and the property manager, as the case may be. We leave that with them and a list of the problems, as I mentioned before, um, as well as routine maintenance recommendations. And so this is a, a very time-intensive, customized program that really ends up being an overall landscape consultation as opposed to entirely focused on irrigation system efficiency. And so we find that people often have very specific plant questions that we are able to address. And with the training that we do with our interns, we are able to address those very well. So we do, again, focus on the irrigation system, but we also provide supplemental information, largely plant-related, as needs be. Could I add something? Yes. I would like to add something to that. I think also, this is Stephanie Dewar with Salt Lake City. Um, as Kelly's talking about the water check program and these interns, they receive such good training, and they find the experience of being in the program so positive that she's not mentioning also many of them come back year after year, even sometimes after they graduate and get legitimate jobs. And so then they bring not only that enthusiasm and passion for conservation, but that wealth of knowledge that they've grown. Um, and they bring that to the doorstep of either households or businesses to talk with people about irrigation and lawn issues. And I think that's one of the things that makes the program even more successful than it could be on paper because of the quality of training and how these um, interns are treated and, and valued within the program. Thank you for that very much. Okay. Next slide, please. So what do we do then? Um, once we've determined precipitation rate and distribution uniformities, as I said, we have the irrigation schedules that we recommend. And those irrigation schedules, I think it's important to point out, emphasize frequency of irrigation changes. And those are based on our weather that we see on a typical growing season. Um, and as I mentioned as well, the improvements are recommended to increase distribution uniformity. Next slide, please. So as you may imagine, after 13,000 plus of these water checks, we have got an enormous amount of data. And as an academic institution, you may expect that we're very interested in data. We are very interested in analyzing the program in every way we can. Um, and we are most definitely interested in program efficacy and associating water savings with our program. Some examples of the data that we collect include irrigated landscaped area, which becomes very, very important as you relate plant water requirements to the landscape. So if you know how much area of a landscape, for example, is covered in grass or other irrigated plant material, then based on local weather conditions, you can determine what the plants needed as opposed to what they got from irrigation. Uh, other information that we collect, irrigation system characteristics. I mentioned some of these already. And then plant requirements. And that is determined after the water check. It's based on local weather conditions, local ET rates, as you see there, and climate data. And then the next step for us is incorporating water billing data. Because of course, that is how we determine the water use of clients before the water check and the water use of clients after the water check. And we monitor that over time. So we don't simply check what they've been doing the next year after they have had a water check. We look at the program's efficacy in an ongoing basis. So for how many years, for example, is water savings associated with the program? Next slide, please. So we do a lot of different types of analyses with our water check data. Uh, we have a number of descript descriptive statistics. I'll show you some examples of that. And then we also develop various statistical relationships among our data. We compare participant water use to determined irrigation requirements, which is what I was mentioning in the previous slide. And we compare water check participants to themselves. What have they been doing? What did they do prior to the water check? What do they do after the water check? And again, what do they do in subsequent years? The other thing that we do to analyze data is we compare water check participants 
and their water use to matched control groups. And by that I mean these are groups of residents or perhaps businesses, but more often residents, that have similar property sizes, similar property values, and so that we may compare essentially an apples to apples comparison. So if someone gets a water check, what are they doing as opposed to someone with a similar property who doesn't get a water check? That's another way that we determine program efficacy. Next slide, please. So these are some examples. We do hand measurements of property size, including the lot entirely, the landscape, and hardscape. And so again, this is all with the goal of determining plant water requirements for the individual property. We determine system, irrigation system rather, characteristics for the different types of sprinklers that we might see on the property, so average operating pressure, distribution uniformity, average precipitation rate for the various types of sprinklers. And it's becoming very interesting over time as a bit of an aside with sprinkler operating pressure. And especially with the emphasis being placed on pressure regulating sprinkler heads, for example. Um, we find that that variation in pressure has a huge impact on what we see with irrigation efficiency on the ground. Next slide, please. So what you see here is an example of some of the data that we analyze. And you have on the bottom distribution uniformity. The dark bars are fixed spray heads. The lighter bars are rotor heads. And you can see the varying levels of distribution uniformity across the bottom there. So uh, basically a bell-shaped curve. So we find that not too many have distribution uniformities in the 0 to 10, 10 to 20 percent range. Um, we find that most of our program participants, and this is a subset, mind you, but most are in the 50 to 70 percent range, depending on the type of sprinkler. And then we have even a few in the 70 to 80 percent range and a few greater than 80, which is pretty stunning when we find those, frankly. Um, so we do have a, a pretty big distribution in terms of distribution uniformity. Next slide, please. Another example of descriptive data that we analyze as part of the program. Um, again, the fixed spray heads are the dark bars. The rotor heads are gray. And in this case, there is a pretty large difference between the two, as you would expect in terms of precipitation rates. So rotor sprinkler heads, they tend to skew to the left. They've got lower precipitation rate if you're talking about inches per hour. The fixed spray heads, more of a bell-shaped curve. So a few on the low end, most of those in the 1.2 to 1.5 inch per hour range uh, and on up. And so this is to be expected. Rotor sprinkler heads would be applying less water. But this gives us a good sense of what's going on in a particular service area. Next slide, please. So this, uh, I don't want people to get too concerned about the equation there. But I do want to note <laughs> that what you see here is a relationship between landscaped area on the properties that we visit and parcel size. And the reason that we've pursued this type of analysis is that after hand measuring 13,000 landscapes, we've got a really good data set of how landscaped area relates to parcel size. And so the thinking here is that if we can develop this relationship and we know uh, what, how landscaped area relates to parcel size, that helps us in evaluating properties that perhaps are not getting a water check. Um, and it may change our practices going forward. If we have a very strong relationship here and we know what parcel sizes are, perhaps we can lighten up, for lack of a, a better word, on our, on our hand measurements. Next slide, please. So in talking with our program partners like Salt Lake City, um, we've learned a few things about the importance of the water checks. Uh, it's a very positive means of interaction between the water supplier and the customer. And it's a great way for the agency to say, you know, perhaps things are going on with your water bill, but hey, we have this program where we can give you some assistance. And so it's a way for the agency to say, we're thinking of you, we're supporting you, particularly during drought. 
I don't, Stephanie, did you have anything to add there? The other thing I would add is, and that's absolutely right, um, I also, as the conservation manager, get lots of calls, you know, the people who are, you know, I, I don't want to call them tattlers because they really care and they're very concerned about water issues in our region, but they want to raise awareness about misuse of water or leaking systems or things like that, and they call. And one of the tools I have in my arsenal when I call a property that I've had a report on is I can offer them a free water check. And so that helps me, one, is to get on, we get people on their property then who can help identify what the issues are and get them repaired. Um, and most people are very glad for that. No one wants to get a call saying that a, a property they're responsible for or their home is wasting water because of bad irrigation practices. If I can soften that blow by saying, hey, I can get you a free water check and this is what they'll do, um, it completely changes the dynamic of that conversation. Um, I also offer it, by the way, to the people who call because they don't necessarily assume that um, they have all the information they may, may need to get. Um, so it really adds and changes the dynamic of that conversation. Great, great. Um, the other thing that we do with the Water Check Program is we also work with our program partners to promote whatever programs, whatever other programs that is they may have in place. So for example, I know that Salt Lake City has a number of small pocket gardens through the city that are water efficient and so we're able to promote those gardens, we're able to promote whatever controllers or rebate programs may be in place, other technologies, and provide whatever information our program partners would like to get out to our water check clients. And, you know, a focus, which you're going to be hearing a lot more about in just a minute, is um, on people with a high capacity to conserve. So um, those folks can be identified and we can work with them to help reduce their water use. Next slide, please. So one of the thing as, things that we've tried to do going through the program is ask people why they're interested in participating in the Water Check program. And this is really going to transition to uh, my colleague Joanna because as we started looking at our program and asking people why they were participating, we had a number of different answers that you can see there. A lot of them were trying to save money, a lot of them were just really interested in water efficient irrigation, they were very concerned with you know meeting plant needs, um, and we found they had a really strong conservation effort. They wanted to help their community conserve water and they wanted to know how efficient their sprinkler system was. So as I was rolling these questions around in my mind and just thinking about the program in general, you know, I'm, I'm a plant scientist by training. And so the human dimensions aspect of the program, it just became much more clear over the years that that was a huge piece that we'd been missing. And so, I began collaborating more with my colleague Joanna Anterwada to address some of those human dimension aspects of the program. Next slide, please, and we'll transition to Joanna Anterwada. So as Kelly mentioned, I'm a social scientist and a policy scientist and focused on the human element of this whole uh, issue of promoting urban landscape water conservation. We've conducted different types of research with various kinds of urban water users over the years. And this research has included observational studies where we seek to explain urban landscape water use patterns where we've interacted with people util utilizing interviews, focus groups, surveys, and water diaries, as well as intervention studies where we've done experiments in trying to alter landscape water use and assess the effectiveness of various conservation approaches. And this is where we have a lot of participant, participant engagement. The Water Check Program is one of those interventions that we've studied. And what we've learned is indicated here on this slide, that people often generally have good intentions. They want to conserve water and they're motivated to do so for a variety of different reasons, individual as well as for the community good. And a lot of the overwatering is innocent. Uh, they don't know how much water landscapes need. Sometimes they run their sprinklers at night. They don't know they have a leak and they don't know some of the things that they should be doing. And when it's brought to their attention, they're often very um, willing to make changes. We found that there's a lot of what we've called situational waste. 
there are a lot of site-specific constraints to efficiency and a lot of opportunities to uh, become more efficient, but there's great variability in residential parcels in terms of where they're located and the kinds of characteristics they have, the kinds of plant material. Um, another thing we've learned is that conservation programs in general attract people who are already efficient and they're seeking information to increase their conservation skills, but what we've wanted to do is reach people who have this capacity to conserve, a phrase that we've um, used to characterize them, as Kelly mentioned. Uh, we've also learned that conserving water is a process, and it involves many actions of change, monitoring, adjustment, and reinforcement over time. And so we often arrive to do a water check, or the water checkers arrive, and people have been working on this for a while, trying to become more efficient, and you're entering into a process that is already going on on the ground for them. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So one of the challenges for achieving landscape water use efficiency is this high variability in site features of urban parcels. Different changes may be needed in each location to ensure that the human behavior of watering plant material with irrigation systems, as Kelly mentioned, that are often not well designed or maintained, is done as efficiently as possible. Uh, urban landscape water use efficiency involves this site-specific contextualized systems thinking, and that is what the Water Check Program seeks to convey and reinforce. Next slide, please. So some of the um, landscape water conservation challenges that we've come to understand through our research uh, are illustrated here. Municipal water conservation programs face several challenges in trying to promote this landscape water use efficiency. How to broaden the influence of the conservation programs, how to find these conservation opportunities, and provide the relevant information that people need. People are all in different uh, places individually as to how much they know and how much they've already worked with their situation. Uh, we're also involved in promoting long-term habit change. There is no one quick fix to being efficient in watering a landscape. As that last one illustrated, you've got site features, irrigation technology, plant material, and human behavior that have to come together in a way that is efficient for the particular location. And um, all of this is the, the challenge, especially we're here in the west of the United States, is preparing for droughts and growing water scarcity and how we can fine tune people's ability to water appropriately during droughts with less consequence to the landscapes they're trying to maintain. Next slide, please. So in order to identify conservation opportunities and broaden the influence of conservation programs, we've developed a software application to analyze and manage urban landscape water use. The analytics behind the software were originally developed in a research context, so we would have an independent measurement of people's relative efficiency. But it's evolved over time to be a water supplier management and a customer information tool. This software has three basic functions, as you see here. Assess is one of the functions to identify locations with capacity to conserve. Uh, deliver water use reports to help people conserve and then track water use changes over time and see their conservation success. Next slide, please. So the assessment function, which is identifying locations with capacity to conserve. Uh, water maps integrates different types of data, classified aerial imagery, parcel data, data from counties, meter data from utilities, and localized DT data. It produces parcel-specific landscape irrigation ratios, which calculate landscape water use in relation to landscape water need. And then this is normalized per unit of landscape area. It accounts for how efficient people are in relation to a changing climate by integrating that ET data. So WaterMaps is designed to conduct, conduct this analysis for an entire service area and to display it spatially 
using GIS. And so here's a small example you see in this slide. The analysis results can be used to direct conservation programming to the locations with capacity to conserve, ones that say are red or yellow on this particular map. Next slide, please. So this gives you an example of a service area uh, in our region that we've worked with and an analysis that was done for 2013 on uh, 1,369 locations. And here you can see that the mean landscape irrigation ratio, or LIR, is over two, slightly over two. And as Kelly mentioned, we think that we can reduce landscape irrigation by about 50%. And this is verification of that. But it's not in all across the board, you have greater gains to be gained in some locations. Uh, next slide, please. So the deliver function of water maps enables the production of water use reports to help inform people about their landscape water use and help them conserve. Here's an example of a report from a project that USU worked on with the Weber Basin Water Conservancy District which has a large service area north of Salt Lake City, Utah. And this particular district, either directly or through retail agencies it supplies, has approximately 100,000 locations with unmetered, pressurized, secondary irrigation systems that are used to water urban landscapes. Uh, these residences are on former agricultural land, and they happen to have water allocations assigned to each property. So the project that we worked with them on involved test implementa implementation of metering on about a thousand households. And information from the new meters was integrated into these reports that were sent to customers on a monthly basis. This was not a water bill. It was just interpreted water use information provision. And as you can see, the report uh, shows their landscape water use, their landscape water need. It calculates the irrigation ratio. In this instance, it was 1.93 over the course of an irrigation season. And um, this was an end of season report where you see the months, the blue bars on the lower left in that diagram show how much water they used, and the green shows how much the landscape actually needed. So it illustrates the overuse of water. And we found that this was quite a motivational tool. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, this, uh, the track function of water maps enables either a municipality or water provider, as well as individual water users, to track their water use over time. So this these graphs illustrate the conservation savings in this Weber Basin project between 2012 and 13 for the houses that were included in this project. And what you see is that um, more people were using water efficiently in 2013 than 2012, and that more people were using within their allocation after receiving the reports. And the average saving was over 71,000 gallons on each property. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, the meter data that Weber Basin Water Conservancy District collected was hourly. So this is an illustration of time of day watering for locations that fall into the different water use categories. And what you see is that people generally follow time of day restrictions in the middle of the day, but overwatering still occurs during the nighttime hours. So providing people with information assessing the appropriateness of the total quantities that they use can provide additional information to motivate conservation. And this example just shows how data and analysis of water use patterns can help inform the development of additional policy tools to promote conservation, and such as the water use reports that would be a water use tool. OK, next slide, please. So landscaping decisions um, are affected by many different types of individuals as well as organizations. 
And so at a broader scale, and this is just to address the public policy angle, public policy and planning decisions affect urban landscape water use through permitting new development in certain locations, establishing different urban forms and densities, implementing building and landscaping codes and ordinances, and setting water pricing structures. So landscaping decisions related to the types of urban vegetation to plant, how to water it, are made by commercial entities and institutions, as well as uh, individual consumers, homeowners, or residents. So, uh, in terms of the social and policy dimensions of landscape water use, municipal water conservation program coordinators, such as Stephanie, have opportunities to bring university research to bear on influencing the many different decisions and decision makers who influence urban landscape water use. So let's go to the next slide and we'll transition to Stephanie Dewar. Hi there. So um, just to give you a bit of an overview over Salt Lake City, um, we are the largest retail water provider in Utah. We are a retail provider, which means we have a direct relationship with the customers who use our water. We have about 90,000 connections, half of which are residential, um, well, in terms of water use. So about three-fourths of our connections are residential and a quarter are commercial. Water use, though, is split more 50-50, with half of our water use going to residential use and half to commercial use. Um, we have about 150,000 commuters who come into our city every day, as we're one of the largest um, industrial and commercial centers in the state. So not only do we have a standing population of about 380,000, we grow by 150,000 every day. In 2000, our gallons per capita use was around 285. I don't have the calculations for this year yet as we're not completed the water year, but last year our gallons per capita was 190. Um, conservation programs, we have a, a five-year water conservation management plan. Um, we just wrote the last plan last year. Um, there are five categories of program initiatives including outreach, economics and finance, utility, infrastructure, law and policy, research and metrics. Next slide, please. But um, I think, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat the stuff on the slide here. I want to get to the questions and the dialogue. But one of the things I'd like to say about the Water Check program is, though its focus is on landscape and specifically the irrigation practices as it relates to turf, this program has crossed into all of our program initiatives. It has implications um, and has directed programs or refocused programs in every other program category in our conservation program. So it touches on financial issues in terms of um, incentives with water savings bills or potentially driving programs around rebate potentials. It touches on education and outreach, obviously, but also on um, its it's invigorated or created a whole category under metrics and research for us. So we're beginning to ask, I guess the point is, is I'm finding in the program what I've learned as a water check, in a sense, participant, um, is that I am learning to ask better questions about my service area and I am questioning all the assumptions we have made in the past about how and when and why people are using water on their landscape. And thanks to the component of the behavioral analysis as part of this, I'm also learning a much better language around this. Um, and I'm communicating those ideas and issues better, not only to my customers, but also to the people who rule my world with budgets and policy. And I'm finding that it is, um, there isn't anything about my program that isn't enhanced through the, what I've learned in the Water Check program and that relationship with USU. Um, so the values are is that I, I am an office of one with all those connections and customers to serve. And yet every summer, every irrigation season, I know there will be well-trained, highly passionate, qualified individuals standing in the yards of residential property owners or commercial property owners, talking to them about very important issues. We deliver information that is applicable, that is scientifically and research-based, 
um, it is not um, negative or critical, but it's helpful and informative, and it works when it's applied. Um, it has also resulted in improved relationships. For instance, um, I have people calling me now asking for water checks, including school districts. Um, that call led to our um, submitting it for a grant that we received, and we're now looking at doing a grant program around the school districts with USU um, to help them improve their water efficiency in their landscapes. Next slide, which is all these other synergies. So the water check program has led to broadening our research and metrics outlook, um, increasing our analytics tools, grant programs, um, the collaborative nature. I'm just getting all excited and Twitter painted <laughs> here. So the collaborative nature between public utilities and USU. Um, there's a list of things I've written down that as they've presented, I'm thinking of other things that we can do and that we need to know and that I need to ask. Um, so besides the specific information, the profile it provides to my water customers so that I can better direct the very limited resources I have, um, I can market those programs and redefine programs in a way to maximize my resources so I am more effective in helping my community address a very real and immediate issue around water use and water waste. Next slide. And is this my slide or your slide? That's Was your that mine? Slide. Well, it's again, I guess I'm just speaking to the same thing that it's the one thing about this, oh, I know. One of the things about this collaboration that's different than, say, a collaboration, um, nothing against consultants at all, but this collaboration is dynamic and flexible and um, responsive that through this collaboration, USU is increasing their research in this area and they're asking more relevant questions. They're providing me with more relevant information. Uh, Joanna said something the other day that I thought was wonderful, which was the idea that through uh, the good science and research that we do provides actionable items in the ground on the community to help us do what we need to do around water conservation. Um, it is also driven by curiosity, the desire to learn, to expand knowledge, and to share information um, not stymied within the context of the narrow constructs of a contract. Um, so it's been everything about the program has has fed and fueled and driven our programs. Next slide. So in summary, um, I think the two take homes we'd like to leave you with uh, are some of the pieces of information we've gained through our programs about homeowners and residents. The fact that they are very motivated by a desire to be efficient with water applied to their landscapes. And those reasons can range from being good stewards of scarce resources. Uh, some may be accomplished gardeners, and they just really want to meet the plant water requirements without exceeding them. They are often motivated by saving money on water bills. And they're often motivated to contribute to their communities. I would characterize Utah as a state that really does have a strong sense of community. And so people do work together very well here. The obstacles they face, however, when it comes to landscape water conservation are situational constraints, as Joanna mentioned, and the need for very individualized assistance because properties are so very, very different. And so providing individualized information and assistance is critical for helping them, as well as providing ongoing informational support so they know how they are doing and they can get their questions answered. Um, historically, a lack of feedback for them on their water use has made it difficult for them to monitor their own conservation. And so I think in this information age, we are all moving towards providing more information so that people can make good decisions on their own. Next slide, please. So 
I know we've gone a little bit over time here. Um, I'll just quickly mention the three websites that you see listed there and direct you to those for providing additional information, including reference materials about everything we've talked about here today as well as, well as other information. And I think we can open it up for questions from the participants. Yeah, we have a lot of questions that have come in. Uh, everyone's very interested in your water checks and your water maps. Um, so before we do that, we're just going to do a quick poll, um, and then we'll get right into the questions. All right, so this is Kimberlyn Velasquez, and um, I just want to say thank you to Kelly Kopp, Joanna Enterwada, and Stephanie Dewar for speaking to the great work being done by the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping, the Salt Lake City Department of Public Utilities, and USU for better understanding consumer attitudes toward water efficient landscapes. And um, like we said, we're just going to do a quick poll, um, and we'd like to ask, what webinar topics are you interested in for the future? I'll just give you a, a second to answer this. Okay. It looks like a lot of people are interested in relationship building between irrigators and utilities. And um, we have about a tie with uh, achieving water savings on large landscapes and using weather-based irrigation controllers. So um, we will get back to you on what webinar we do next. Thanks, Kimberlyn. So let's get into some of these questions. So first we'll start with questions about the water checks. So People are wondering how much time does a residential water check typically take um, and if you could speak to the training that the interns receive. Sure. So the water checks can take, I would say they average, <clears throat> excuse me, one and a half hours. And so obviously that's a lot of time to look through a landscape with a resident and identify issues and answer their questions. Um, so it is a significant investment of time, but it's one that we have found is worthwhile in terms of ongoing water savings. Mm -hmm. To address the training question, because we are a, a land-grant university, we have a lot of faculty with areas of expertise like soil science, plant science, irrigation technologies. Um, I have colleagues who can address whatever the issue may be as it relates to landscape water conservation. And so our interns go through a solid week of training with various faculty members uh, as well as others to gain that knowledge. But as Stephanie said, we have them returning year after year typically and so it becomes a little bit easier. Um, more recently we're training them on some technological advances we've made with the program including a data collection app and that is streamlining, streamlining our process significantly. Great. And how have you promoted the water check program? How did you get people involved and how did you get permission to come to their properties? Um, we've done it a number of different ways. This is Stephanie. Um, one is when people call the utility because they complain about their water bill, all of our customer service staff have been trained to direct them to the water check program, including even helping them sign up or providing phone numbers so that they can call. We then follow back up with those individuals to make sure that they've signed up or that they were able to get through. We also promote it on our, our through social media, our Facebook page, um, our websites, every event. Um, typically during the irrigation months, I participate in presentations at community council meetings, at homeowners associations, at fairs and events that happen throughout our community and service area. Um, and I speak about the water check program at all of those events. So it's a variety of ways um, that we promote it. There's also a state program called Slow the Flow, and they're a statewide program that's sponsored through the governor's office and the Division of Water Resources, and they also assist in promotion. Sounds like you have some good venues set up. And, and 
how a lot of people are wondering about cost and how is this cost effective and is it something that you think other utilities could implement if they didn't have this kind of relationship with an extension university? Well, okay, so a couple of to, to that, one is it's very cost effective. It's about 150 about about $100, 150 for a residential audit. Commercial site audits may be lo um, more expensive because those sites could be larger. Um, it, the value of, uh, we could do this probably internally. I could hire students and have them do this. But what I wouldn't have, though, is the access to, A, the level of training, but also the analytics and that um, academic rigor that gets attached to this program. It's not just going into someone's yard and doing an audit and doing catch cups. It's collecting this data, looking at the data, thinking about how, what kinds of questions to ask. It's bringing in the behavioral aspects of it. We've made so many assumptions about why and how people water in their landscapes. And our conservation programs and our, our messaging statewide have been driven by those assumptions. And I have learned through this program that many of those assumptions were incorrect. And without that research and analytics behind the program, we would still be doing the wrong thing. We might be able to do it for a little cheaper, but it would be ineffective. Um, it doesn't help me to spend money on something that might look good that doesn't deliver actual water savings. I don't have that. I have a very small program. There are water districts in my state that have millions of dollars to spend. I have less than $100,000. If I had to spend every dime on the water check program, I would. That's a very that positive a endorsement. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I sometimes it's I, I'm annoying because I won't take a stand. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we have a lot of really great questions, and I, if you don't mind, we can send them over to you, and we can kind of get following up with people after the webinar, because we don't have time for everything. But people also have questions about the water map software. Is this available for other organizations to use, and is there a cost? The way we've operated it right now is that uh, we work as partners with utilities in running it because there's a lot of data preparation that has to go into it. But uh, we're interested in developing it further for potential use uh, of putting it in utilities' hands. That's something we're in the process of looking at right now. But we have been applying it in Utah uh, in collaboration with utilities. So could people, if people are interested in being like a utility that works with you, should they contact you or are you just kind of still on a small scale? Yes. No. They should contact us. Yes. Okay. Great. So we, like I said, we have a lot of great questions. So I'm going to ask a few more. If Do you guys mind if we go over a little bit? No. Not We're at all. Okay. We're okay. Okay. Great. So just going back to the water checks quickly, uh, have you determined what practices are most common after the water check is complete? For example, head replacement or doing micro irrigation or do they implement your schedules that you recommend? Well, we know that I, okay, <laughs> we're actually in the, pr in the process of doing a, a small scale pilot study to evaluate exactly what it is they, that homeowners are doing and what is most effective. Um, but just anecdotally, I would say that what we see is we're getting the most savings as it relates to providing the irrigation schedule to folks because we find that when we get to the property or the residence, whatever it may be, they're doing some sort of irrigation. They have a schedule, but they have no sense whatsoever of how it might need to change over the season. And so just conveying that one piece of information that plant water requirements change over the season, and here is the irrigation schedule that addresses that, seems to be the biggest game changer. Um, but as you mentioned, some of the other fixes that we recommend, you know, we identify and quantify 
a number of different irrigation problems. Um, and so part of our small uh, intervention study is to see what happens if we give them the schedule? What happens if we actually make small repairs? What happens if we give them a climate-based controller? What happens with, with various com combinations of these items? And so, you know, sort of as an ongoing research project, we're trying to drill down into that question a little bit more. And, and if I could add to that is part of that, an outcome of that research is Joanna Kelly and I talking about other future program opportunities and grant opportunities to, so that I, if the issue is an irrigation controller, well, could I do something where I help people acquire and install irrigation controllers? Could I do something to help people get the right kind of sprinkler components that would make the difference? So by having the research in place that tells me where the real needs are, it's going to help me make my program more efficient and more effective in the future. That makes sense. Going back to the water map tool, how did you get the information for the landscape need versus landscape usage? How did you get that data? Was it from utility bills? and The landscape water use is mined from billing data, but with some assumptions that take out the indoor water use. So we're re that is one of the big things is isolating what goes on the landscape. And so we that's where that information comes from. To get landscape water need, we've used the aerial imagery and we've classified what's on the ground so that it separates turf from trees and shrubs and from turf under trees. Uh, in some instances, we've been able to do that when we've had the imagery that takes pictures at times that leave, leaves are not on the trees because we have snowfall in this area and we can get that. And then they are assigned different water need requirements that modifies the ET rate for, for that area. So it gets a water budget for the landscape that's very specific to what they have on their property. And that has been a very compelling argument to make with them that this is a water budget not just for any lot or a landscape irrigation ratio for just any lot, but for their lot in particular. And um, so that's where we get it. But we have to integrate the parcel data from the counties and all so that we're putting that all together. And that's what water maps does. It integrates those various kinds of databases in order to make those calculations that result in the landscape irrigation ratio. Thank you. Do you, the data that you provided on the savings, was that unmetered accounts where meters were introduced um, to provide efficiency or did you already have savings for standard metered accounts? And has that changed substantially over time? The information that I think you're asking about was formerly they were unmetered. The meters get put on in one year and then the following year we started sending them these reports and the subsequent year we and then we saw the difference between the two years. So it's for that property metered data but we did not have historical metered data going back very far for those properties because they were formerly unmetered. So these are the two years post implementation of the meters where these reports were sent to them and we saw the change. So as far as we know the reports were the tool for affecting that change. And in um, a number of the analyses that we've done, we've taken out mobility, residential mobility, and other factors that could confuse what the savings was due to. And we're pretty uh, confident. We also did a survey with people afterwards about the effectiveness and their response to the report. So it was this site-specific interpreted information uh, that was the experiment and um, appears to have been effective in producing these savings. And in fact, the Weber Basin Water Conservancy District is continuing with these reports and has continued to see savings. 
Hmm. So as a follow-up to that question, of the 13,000 checks that you did, most of those were art. They were previously unmetered until you did the check. Oh, oh I, I think I think you're getting two things a little bit mixed up there. So the 13,000 checks are part of the water check program. The water maps did about 1,300. Did about 1,300 properties. Okay. In that experiment project in that project, yeah. And and so most of and and across Utah, there's a, a great variety about in communities about what is metered and where it's not metered. We also have culinary water, which is treated drinking water, and then we also have secondary water. Not all communities have secondary water access. Um, and my, by the way, I should add that that's not some magical second source of water. It's the same stream flow. It's just untreated water that flows through irrigation ditches. Um, that actually that relates to a question that was also asked about whether reclaimed water is used for irrigation in the areas that you work in, and if so, are you seeing reduced pressure with these systems? Well, in our area, reclaimed water would probably be almost as highly pressurized. Um, we're an area of, of very diverse geographical, um, within Salt Lake City Public Utility Service Area, for instance, we have elevation changes of 1,200 feet. Um, the other issue with reclaimed water here is that we have um, highly um, alkaline soils, acidic or alkaline water, um, low microbial count and organic material in our soils. And we actually have a lot of groundwater intrusion into our sewer waste lines, which causes an increased amount of uh, total dissolved solids and soluble salts in our waste stream. So using reclaimed water on the landscape, we're still looking at how that could be feasible given the quantity of salt and the cost of extracting those salts from our waste stream. So there are some communities that are doing some reuse water on landscapes, typically in larger commercial areas or in public um, properties like municipal golf courses. Um, but we're not using it extensively yet, in part because of those um, issues around water quality. And um, we're still trying to do, we're still trying to determine how best to approach that. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. And do you find that there's ever negative effects on the customer's lawns with the run times that you provide, or they've been pretty tailored to the property? You know, over all the years of the program and all of the thousands of water checks, I have to say I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised and happy that we've, we've I don't think we've, maybe yeah. I would say a handful of times we've had I, some negative feedback, yeah. but it's been by and large positive. And again, you know, where folks are irrigating about twice what they need to, you know, getting them into the ballpark, it, it very, very rarely has any negative implications for their landscapes. And I would say that, um, you know, a goal of ours is, is to not reduce anyone's landscape quality and just to save the water. Yeah, because we couldn't, it would be difficult for me to sell this program in my community if it resulted in a decline in landscape aesthetics. And so USU is very, well, and as Kelly mentioned, she's by training is in plant sciences. Um, and the last thing they're going to recommend are schedules that would cause the decline in the landscape. One thing they're very, one of the things they do when they're in the yards though, is they also talk to people about some of the things they can do to identify turf stress, and some of the things here that when people see stress in the lawn, they think it's because of underwatering and they increase their watering. It's actually because of overwatering that they're seeing those particular problems. So typically, so things like fungus um, and insect problems are typically related to overwatering. So when they stop that practice, they typically see a more healthy lawn because they don't have those fungus and disease problems. Interestingly enough, in a, one of the research projects we did, and we've had a few instances of these, where the recommended schedule has actually been a little bit more than what they were watering mm -hmm. because we have erred on the side of being a little generous. Mm -hmm. And so a more um, general schedule uh, sometimes is not as efficient as what the people were doing prior to that, and so that's one of the things the water checkers look at 
and why they would assess what they were already watering and if they were already watering before uh, below that schedule, uh, they are applauded and their good behavior is reinforced. Hmm. The final question that we're going to ask today is really kind of related to a point that you brought up about people being potentially resistant to changes in their landscape and you focus uh, these programs mostly on legacy landscapes and is that because you find that people aren't interested in changing to native or more drought resistant or water efficient species? Uh, no. In fact, we do provide that information when we give water checks. Some, some people are more interested in making changes in plant material than others, and we are absolutely in support of those efforts. In fact, some of the colleagues that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk are very, very focused on developing new varieties, new hybrids, um, evaluating plants for their low water use characteristics. So that is definitely within our wheelhouse, and we do work to provide that information for homeowners who are interested. But, you know, sort of the lowest hanging fruit, I would say, for us is getting them to irrigate what they have appropriately. So I think that that's a, a very logical starting point, even if it's just long enough for them to make changes that they want to make. At least if we can get them irrigating what they have appropriately, we know they're going to be saving water. I also think that given um, the research that USU and other uh, land-grant colleges are doing around turf, in terms of new turf varieties, I don't know that we need to focus on altering the landscape. Um, I think focusing on you know smarter turf varieties and then how to manage those grasses is a good place to go. And when we talk about people altering their landscape from a turf-based or a legacy-based appearance to say a, a more shrub-based, keep in mind that is not just a um, that's not a simple thing of you just don't, you go in and you rip out your grass and you put in new plants. It takes a different skill set in terms of managing that landscape and maintaining it and um, a different set of inputs, which can in itself create a whole new area. Um, like we have to deal with issues of dust and heat island effect. Um, if we, in our valley, if we did not ir irrigate our landscape, we would not have mature shade trees. So we have to balance these competing needs and issues so that we sustain a landscape that provides both aesthetic beauty but also a physical oasis um, and find a way to do that in context of our existing and future water supply. And the Water Check program gives us that very good information so that we can help our, our community achieve that balance. I think what we're doing, in a sense, is slightly expanding the definition of a low water landscape. Mm -hmm. um, we've often not used that term to refer to the plant material itself. Right. But the point of the contextualized systems thinking diagram is that a low water use landscape is one in which, given the site constraints that someone faces, they have brought together the human behavior to apply water through an irrigation system to the plant material that they have in an efficient way. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that final perspective. And thank you all for those questions. I'm going to turn it back to Kimberlyn with EPA for just a final slide and closing. Oh, and uh, this is just a list of publications um, from our presentation today. Um, I want to say thank you again to our speakers. It was a great presentation, and thank you so much to everyone who joined us for the webinar today. Um, here we just have a list of resources uh, for our outdoor side of the program that you can use. And um, please feel free to email or call the helpline with any questions you might have, or uh, if you have any follow-up questions that you didn't get to ask today. Um, and please have a great afternoon, and we hope to see you on our next webinar. Thank you again. Thank you, and thank you all speakers, too. Thank you. Thank you.